defending Jodi Arias and her parents. Friends, including a woman who fears for her life, are here. They say it's not mom and dad's fault that their daughter is a cold-blooded killer. Good evening, everybody. My co-host this week is Samantha Shocker. She is host of Pop Trigger on the Young Turks Network. And coming up, Jody's one-time friend tells me about the pain she has suffered as a result of Jody's actions. And a friend of Jody's parents say they're being victimized as well, perhaps by her daughter, perhaps those of us that are watching her daughter. But first, Jody's first jury deadlocked on punishment. Will her defense try the same strategy with jury number two? Take a look. She could never even imagine doing something so vile. And when she did something like that, so bad that she couldn't even accept that she did it, she lied. She lied to herself. She lied to the detective. She lied to the media. And she lied to Travis's family. The state's own witness, Dr. DeMarte, came in and told you that Jody suffers from borderline personality disorder. Jody cannot choose to have a personality disorder or not. It is not her choice. In other words, she didn't wake up one morning and think that it would be great to have a personality disorder. She was once a bubbly and happy little girl. And Shanna Hogan is an investigative reporter and the author of the upcoming Jody Arias book, Picture Perfect. Shanna, what is the latest news? Hi, Dr. Drew. We're hearing tonight yeah. that the county attorney has not made a definitive decision about whether or not they're going to go forward with the death penalty, and they're considering some other ways to resolve the case. And if he resolves, if he withdraws the intent to seek the death penalty, Jody might get life in prison. But there's still that question of parole, which is a big concern for Travis Alexander's family. We're likely to hear more on Thursday, which is a, a, the upcoming hearing date. Thank you so much, Shanna. Joining us to discuss, Attorney Ariva Martin, Attorney Mark Iglar from SpeakToMark.com, and Marsha Clark, former prosecutor and author of a new book, Killer Ambition, which is out tomorrow. Congratulations, Marsha. Let me ask you this, Marsha. What are they going back and forth about? Is, this a, is it a plea deal in the making? Probably. I mean, after you have a hung jury after a case of this length and so much testimony, the one thing that they would all like to do is find closure without having to go through all of it again. And if there can be some agreement reached to avoid another penalty trial, which, by the way, would probably require a great deal of retrial of the initial murder itself because that's their main factor in aggravation, their main factor for imposing the death penalty, I mean, that's it, is the pain and torture, then they will, pry, they will avoid it. Otherwise, they're going to have to be going through this whole thing again. Mark, I, I don't know if you agree with that. I'll, Reeve, I'll get your comments in just a second. But, Mark, I, I think closure is a television word. I think this just allows the family to escape further dismay from all this. Well, that's correct. But I do agree with Marsha. I think that the defense's definition of winning is doing everything they can to save her life. So they're going to try as much as they can with the prosecution, try to get them to take death off the table. But let's make one thing very clear. The prosecutors will never do that, if ever, unless they're certain that she will not be able to get parole. So if the prosecution ever changes their mind, they'll put out there, you agree to life without the possibility of parole, and then we'd consider taking death off the table if they ever agree to do it. Ariva, you agree? I agree, Dr. Drew. I think the entire public is so, you know, exhausted by this case that if we could, you know, wake up tomorrow or one day and read the headlines that a deal has been reached and Jody's going to spend the rest of her life in jail without the possibility of parole, as much as I think the public wanted to see this woman sentenced to death for this horrific crime, I think everyone will feel like justice has been served. You know, the it's death Dr. penalty, Drew. clearly this is a case forward, but the closure is so important. And, Samantha, I agree with Ariva, although that word closure keeps coming up here. The fact is, just the way we're exhausting it, can you imagine what the family's feeling? I can't imagine what the family's feeling, and I, and I really sympathize for them. And I, I want to point out the statement that we heard earlier from the defense, that Jody Arias was essentially lying because she, it was such a terrible act, what she did to Travis. No, she was lying because she didn't want to be caught. She was lying because she didn't want to be held accountable for her actions. And she was such a great liar, too. I mean, oh, uh, thank I you mean, for pointing uh, that out, Samantha. I, I, I just wanted to go ahead go ahead Ariva 
I, I wanted to say just quickly, Dr. Drew, if this does go to the penalty stage again, I hope the defense attorney doesn't make that same argument. I was sitting here just, you know, ready to, to throw up listening to that. Right. The woman lied because she's a liar. The woman lied because she didn't want to get caught. She didn't want to face the consequences of her action. I think the jury is smart enough. It's proven to be smart enough not to buy into that. So if there is a penalty right. uh, phase of this case, let's hope that there's a, a more cogent and persuasive argument by the defense counsel. Now I want to switch gears and talk to Patty Womack. She asked us to introduce her as Jody's former friend. And Patty, I know you've been very emotional when talking about Jody. Now, now, what, what, why has this triggered so much emotion for you? Well, there's a few things that it's emotional for me. Um, one thing is because Jody used to be my best friend, and we shared so many great memories together you know, as children, and um, memories that I will always love and cherish. And um, so knowing that my former best friend that I had amazing memories with is, in fact, a murderer, it's heartbreaking. And Patty, and what, what ages were you guys, Patty, what ages were you guys best friends, from when to when? Um. Twelve to twenty, we were best friends. Um, Twelve to when? I'm sorry, I missed that. Twelve to twenty. I'm sorry. Um, I met her, we met each other when we were 12 years old. Um, mm -hmm. We continued to be best friends into our, t our 20s. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we started to grow apart in our, in our early 20s because I started a family. I got married and she moved up north. And, um, but from do 12 you to think, 20, do you I'm, think that, that what you were feeling intimately connected to was just a fantasy, that it's not the person you thought she was? Because you didn't think she was capable of this. No, I didn't think she was incapable. In fact, everybody that was friends with her that are still my friends, we were all so shocked and blown away. We were like, how could this sweet, sweet girl ever do this? This has to be a typo. This has to be a mistake, you know? This has to be a joke. This could not be Jody. Let, let me interrupt you, uh, so Patty. Yeah. I'm sorry. I want, I know, I've got a panel that's ang anxious to speak with you. Who, who will, Mark, you want to ask something first here? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's possible that between the ages of 12 to 20, she wasn't ready or capable of killing. At some point after the fact, we know by her own admission, we know from the overwhelming evidence that she made that choice to premeditate and slaughter him. So her words are of value. We have some insight. You can do some work with that clinically, Drew. But I'm not yeah. sure the relevance at all in the actual penalty phase, really. Yeah. Uh, and Patty, I know you've taken a lot of heat for even being willing to say anything positive about her. Uh, how, has, how has that affected you? Um, well, a couple people um, have made fake citations about me and posted them on a few different um, websites saying, you know, I had a drug problem, up to DUIs, um, aggravated assault, and they're just all lies. Um, I've never been in trouble, for one. Um, second of all, they had put my home address out there with a description of my house, where I lived, and a map. You know, and one of the sites they put it on was um, State versus Jody, and that site has over 50,000 people on it. And wow. so I've never, ever received a death threat, but, yeah, I do fear for my safety because if you think 50,000 people, like the whole entire world, it seems like, knows where I live, who I am have pictures of me and my daughter on the internet. And so it's really, it's really oh, emotional yeah. and really hard. <sighs> right. Uh, so, Samantha, you want to ask I, a question real quick, then we have to go to break. I, doctor, I actually wanted to ask you a question. Is there any advice that you could give Patty? I cannot believe that she's going through this. How, how can you help her? How can she heal? How can she move forward with her life? 
Well, I, I think the reality is she's right that you can't ignore a lot of this, that these aren't explicit threats. And there are remedies out there if anybody does make an explicit threat to you. But it, it can be challenging. I mean, any of us that have a public life, the kinds of things people say on the Internet are just brutal and mm -hmm. awful. We're, we're going to talk about Amanda Bynes later in the show. It's really tough. And for someone who doesn't uh, sign up for this, it can be extremely disturbing. And, and uh, I... I, I feel bad for Patty. I, I, you know, it's, it's. I understand why it happens. It makes sense to me. And we, any of us, if we say anything that's not in line with everybody's opinion out there, we get smacked. Get attacked. All right. Next up, Jody's parents are paying a deep price as well for their daughter's crime. We have a friend who's here to talk about the parents and what the price they're paying. Yeah. When I was younger, I remember my mom used to work. I guess she was working as a server with my dad. He owned restaurants my whole life. Um, and then when I was around 11 or 12, she um, became a dental assistant. And she was always calling, you know, crying that she needed money, forking out more money. My, my wife went, took time off work, went down there, got her rent U-Haul, put out $2,500 to bring her back here. She will be haunted by what she did, by what she's done to her own family. Time for the Behavior Bureau, co-host still with me, of course, Samantha Shocker, and joining us, Jenny Hutt, host of Sirius XM Radio, also a forensic and clinical psychologist, Cheryl Errett, behavior expert and body language expert, Patty Wood, psychologist, Wendy Walsh, author of 30 Day Love Detox, and Ken Pittenger. Now, Ken knows Jody's parents, and he has written a letter in the local paper in support of Jody's parents after he had observed the harassment they had been subjected to. Here is just a part of it. Here we go. I'm writing this letter because I'm concerned about Bill and Sandy and their struggle to keep their business, Daddy O's Restaurant, alive while enduring the murder trial of their wayward daughter. Additional pain is being brought on by people who wanted to inject vicious comments on Facebook and anonymous telephone calls making threats and taunts, quote, hope your daughter fries in hell, unquote, quote, hope your business dies too, unquote. Ken, thanks for joining us. Again, we're talking about the sort of collateral damage that Jody has caused uh, through social media and other means. What her, Jody's actions harmed a lot of people. But I guess the question I'm going to ask on, parts of, on the part of viewers and the people who make these sorts of uh, horrible sorts of uh, overtures, why should somebody have sympathy for Jody's parents? Ken? You are Oh, I can think because, uh, do we have Ken here? Uh, yes, most most families uh, occasionally have a wayward child, whether it be male or female, and you can't blame the parents, especially when a child is as old as Jody is. Can't blame the parents for what what the decision she makes. Well, Ken, but let let's let's suspend that for a second and say people are making them, judging them. And you're asking for some sympathy, and I don't disagree with you, but why? Why should people feel sympathetic? <laughs> because they're not, they're not the uh, guilty party. They're victims as well as the, uh, the family who's lost the, their loved one. And, Jenny, uh, I saw you waving your hand. Hang on, Ken, I'm sorry. Jenny, you want to ask a question of Ken? Well, I just, I just wanted to, to comment on that concept that they're victims just like Travis's Go ahead, family. I mean, look, I, I think there is some level of the fact that they're victims, of course, because it's their daughter who perpetrated a crime and not them, and now they're being attacked. I get that. But what I don't understand, and Ken, maybe you can answer this, is they're longtime members of this community, right? So, so they should have roots there, and I would think that the community would be there to sort of hold them and help them during this horrible time. Why do you think your community at large as a whole isn't doing that? Well, I, th I think they are to a degree, since I wrote my letter to the editor. I think a lot of people just weren't aware that uh, Jody's parents were the owners of Daddy O's uh, restaurant. And you've known this family for two generations. Uh, reading your letter to the paper, which I had, it suggested that you knew the grandparents. Could, is this a family? Again, we don't have no sense of them and who they are and their relationship, but could you ever, having known them for two generations, have imagined, al although you dismiss families that have wayward children and whatnot, certainly I work with families that children, you know, uh, unexpected problems emerge, is this a family you could have ever imagined would have had something like this happen? I can't imagine it, but I, to that degree, uh, I certainly understand the wayward daughter aspect because I have one myself. 
but she didn't go as far as as Jody had. She just uh, has messed up her personal life with her and for her kids. And just so we get a sense, again, we only have the, what we see from afar of the couple. The Jody's parents, they have a stable relationship. They're still together. They still operate that business together. Is that a fair description or is it different? Well, I think that's a fair description. They're working hard to try and survive this, this mess that their daughters put them into. And, and how are they doing? Well, I think they're doing very well under the circumstances. Uh, it's, it's just a very painful thing to see their daughter go through this, especially for, for uh, uh, the, the mother. Uh, the, uh, the dad is pretty angry that, that people are so vicious about it, but he's not happy with his daughter either because he tried to get his daughter to uh, break the relationship with this guy some time ago. Oh, that's interesting. All right, I can't hang on there. I want to go to my bureau. Did, Dr. I, did some, Cheryl, you have Can something I, to say? Go ahead, Cheryl first. I do, I do. Ken, it really, it seems to me when I read your letter that you really wanted to reach out and do something for the parents because you identify with them because you have a daughter you had trouble with too. Why do you think that so many people want to channel this energy and this kind of hatred toward the parents? What is, what's your understanding of what that's about? Do you think it's that they're helpless and they can't get at Jody so they blame and get at the parents? Or What's your feeling about why this is happening? to the Arias family? I think because we have a, a degenerate society that's going downhill, and it's just their own frustrations about what's going on with the, their own lives. Mm. That's just my, that is a pretty I know psychology. Well, that's a, well, I understand, I, and I've got a group of them here. Well, Wendy, I'll let you comment on <laughs> It's a pretty profound statement Ken's suggesting. What do you think? It, well, I think he's talking about sort of the disassociation and the isolation that w so many young people are experiencing when they get away from their roots that are keeping them shaped. But I'll tell you why these parents deserve our sympathy, because there but for the grace of God go us. I mean, every parent out there lives thinking, I'm trying to do the best job I can, but what if? Because as psychologists, we know that sometimes perfectly healthy families produce crazy kids and sometimes crazy families produce healthy kids so it's not all just about parenting and people should be careful about judging because sometimes it's biological predisposition that's exactly well it's, it's biology is all kinds of stuff pa Sh sam i'm going to give you a chance in a second but patty i see you shaking nodding your head vigorously yes, go ahead and i just think about those parents being exposed i mean they are vulnerable to attack and when you're feeling all that vetrol that the public is feeling about this case they're vulnerable to having that other people's anger absolutely absolutely fired at them and that's unfortunate i think people want a place to put that anger and this is where they're doing it Samantha. It's beyond dangerous, Dr. Drew. Listen, it's one thing to be angry. It's another thing to be threatening them. They're going through their own personal hell. You can't blame the parents. They can't be held accountable for their daughter's heinous crime. Well, you know, uh, not, listen, I, I, it's funny. We, we talked to Patty Womack before who was feeling physically threatened and her, her daughter's safety was in question. I, I, my Twitter just went off like crazy. People are telling me to do my homework. Patty's a liar. They're attacking her even just because we put her on here and questioned her about what it feels like to be under the gun with all this. And she's never and condoned Jody I, listen, Arias. Listen, the point is this is brutality. People are acting out through the Internet, and it, it's getting a little dangerous. I, I agree with you. So it's, uh, it's something. Just stop and think about this a little bit. These, these people didn't ask for this. And we're making the point that some of this comes from genetic some of it comes from who knows what not right. from people that cause it in their family system i think the behavior bureau has made an important point okay. thank you guys and thank you ken uh, it's really interesting hopefully we'll talk to you again a few further jenny want to put a button on this <laughs> yeah i just wanted to say i think ken's whole message was love thy neighbor and wouldn't it be better if everybody tried to sort of help the parents we can't undo the horrible thing that jody arias did we can't but as and a society jenny, we'll we could six, move forward we'll into all a sing healing kumbaya, place. jenny it'll be great it'll be awesome <laughs> no, that's next, what i think next, next. <laughs> Go ahead, Samantha. Uh, Dr. Drew, I just want to say what a great show, and thank you for having me. I look forward to the rest of the it, week. It is our pleasure having you. It was a good show. Thank you, Samantha Shocker. Thank you to all our guests tonight. Of course, thank you all for watching.